In this lesson, what we're going to do is talk about the structure of the Conservative Party. Now, we're going to do a lesson for all three of the political parties, um, just so we can go into it in a little bit more detail um, than if we were to just do one lesson for all three. So, specifically, what we're going to do is examine issues relating to the Conservative Party in terms of its structure, namely the national structure of the party, the local structure of the party, the process for appointing a leader, which is a very simple process, and an even more simple process, which is the process for deciding policy. That's what we're going to do in this lesson. Now, as a basic introductory um, remarks, shall we say, uh, when discussing the structure of political parties, each of them shared some commonalities, okay? So every single political party has a leader, okay? For example, the leader of the Conservatives is the incumbent Prime Minister Boris Johnson. The leader of the Labour Party is the leader of the opposition, Sir Keir Starmer. And we also have people like the leader of the Liberal Democrats, who I believe is still Ed Davey. We are uh, <laughs> not sure how or what's going on with that. But in terms of the leaders, that's who we've got um, for these political parties. Immediately under this position is the position of ministers or the ministerial positions. So whether they be for the Conservative Party, the ministers of government, so people like the Secretary of State for the Home Department, that is uh, Priti Patel, etc, uh, etc, et and we'll talk about others as we go along. Um, or we're talking about shadow ministers or people who are... Um, on the front benches of the opposition and these are the case for in cases of the opposition mainly Labour Party and then next we have MPs which are just the members of parliament so these would refer specifically to the backbenchers of the political parties now we'll talk a little bit about backbenchers uh, a little bit later on in this lesson when we talk about the 1922 committee but backbenchers again a vote on legislation and they you know propose questions to the government etc etc and we have um, backbenchers um, who sit on the side of the government um, who are the MPs for the Conservative Party and then finally we have the much lower levels of the Conservative Party so we have people like local councillors constituency associations and branches uh, and ordinary members of the party as well as that, we also have members of the devolved institutions, so the Scottish Parliament and the uh, the Welsh Assembly and the Assembly of Northern Ireland. Uh, and these are what we would describe as the grassroots of the party. So when people talk about political parties, colloquially, we tend to talk about them in regard to their sort of national identity. So mainly talking about the Prime Minister and talking about MPs and talking about people who are in government, who are in Parliament. But they are only the tip of the iceberg. The vast majority of local action and the vast majority of the political processes um, actually take place at a grassroots level. So again, through local elections, which are actually coming up in May, as well as um, constituency associations and branches of the Conservative Party, as well as members of devolved institutions. Now, when we're talking about the basic functions of political parties, these are very, very easy to understand, so I'm not going to go into them into too much detail. The first is representation. Of course, a political party provides representation for the members of the political party. They are represented in Parliament, they are represented in local councils, they are represented in devolved institutions. We know this to be the case. Very, very easy to understand. Participation. Engaging with and joining a political party is a way for people um, or ordinary people to engage with and participate in in the political process in a little bit more detail uh, aside from just through elections so those who want to engage in the political process other than just doing it through elections can do so using um, political parties similar in a similar fashion to that of joining pressure groups recruitment political parties serve the function of being able to recruit members um, to both uh, council positions to uh, positions within devolved institutions to members of parliament and even to the front benches and the uh, ministerial positions and the ministers of government uh, policy political parties come together and decide on policy decisions that end up being part of the manifesto we'll talk a little bit later about how this is done with the conservative party but it's a very very simple process and then finally for the formation of government political parties form governments when they win a majority in the house of commons this has happened at every single general election uh, and uh, there may sometimes be uh, quite sticky situations where we have um, hung parliaments where no one um, really won any considerable majority in parliament however um, this is actually increasingly rare and we only seen this happen in 2017 and we also saw it happen in uh, i believe 2010 with the coalition government so those are the basic functions of political parties. Now let's actually get into looking at the structure of the Conservative Party in particular. 
At a national and local level, the Conservative Party has a lot of different institutions and structures of organisation. At the more local level, we have what are called Conservative Associations. Now, the Conservative Associations exist in each constituency and they have the, pro, uh, and they have the purpose of helping with the administration of campaigns for elections. So they help out with uh, the operation and administration of election campaigns. This is very important for by-elections. This is very important for general elections as well. At a more regional level, we have conservative parties within the devolved regions themselves. So, for example, this includes the Welsh Conservative Party and also the Scottish Conservatives. So we tend to delineate between um, the Conservative Party that sits in Westminster, um, that being the, the, the party that is currently in power at the moment, and those who sit, for example, in the Scottish Parliament, the Scottish Conservatives, who um, are presenting and are a, a, a considerable challenge to the Scottish National Party, although the SNP still seems to be um, very much in favour, uh, very much the majority party within Scotland. At a more national level, we have these the following institutions that we're going to unpack in a little bit more detail. We have the National Conservative uh, Convention, sorry. Uh, we have the 1922 Committee, specifically within Parliament. We have the Conservative Campaign Headquarters, or CCHQ. And we have the Board of the Conservative Party. These are all different things that do different things at the same time. So, the National Conservative uh, Convention, let's begin with that. This makes decisions for the voluntary party itself, for the voluntary Conservative Party. It is attended by a number of different Conservative members, including the constituency association chairs, so the people we talked about uh, a couple of minutes ago, the people who run and help with the administration of campaigns as well as regional officers and members of offshoots of the party. So, for example, um, uh, youth uh, movements within the party or women's organisations within the party and also regional officers such as those from the um, Scottish Conservatives and the Welsh Conservative Party, etc, etc. So the more grassroots and sort of medium level members of the Conservative Party uh, will tend to attend the um, Conservative uh, National Conservative Convention. The 1922 committee, however, is a much more parliamentary only institution or, uh, or committee itself. It is the official Conservative Private Members Committee in the House of Commons. It is made up of only Conservative members of the House of Commons and the current chair of the 1922 committee is the backbench MP Sir Graham Brady. Uh, Sir Graham Brady has been the the chair since 2010, if my memory serves me correctly. And uh, effectively, they've, there's, it was established in 1923. The 1922 committee only really uh, gained um, notoriety and, uh, and influence um, following the 1940s, and it grew in influence from there. Um, there was some talk of including um, government ministers uh, in the 1922 committee. Specifically, David Cameron suggested this proposal during the coalition government. However, this uh, did actually anger quite a lot of uh, backbench MPs. So we have a situation where we have uh, a number of backbench MPs running the private members committee, uh, which is the 1922 committee. Next, we have CCHQ. Very simple to understand, based in London and acts as the main headquarters for the party as a whole. OK, you might hear quite a lot about CCHQ whenever we have an election process taking place. And then finally, the governing um, body of the party is the board of the Conservative Party. So these are the main institutions that exist within the Conservative Party itself. It's quite a very simple process for um, both appointments and also for policy making. So let's talk about that next. So the appointment of leaders is um, slightly different in each party, so it's important that we talk about the appointment process um, for each of these lessons. Uh, the Conservative places quite a lot of emphasis on the power of MPs within this process. You'll notice that MPs will vote on candidates, on leadership candidates, when they get whittled down to the final two. So we see that all the way up to the final two candidates um, for um, the Conservative leadership position, um, MPs are the people that have the most say. Now they may all they may televise debates and, and other stuff like that, like in the last leadership process where we had a number of different people, um, such as um, uh, such as people like Rory Stewart, we had um, uh, Jeremy Hunt, and obviously we had Boris Johnson all on the stage, uh, and there was a couple of others as well, um, all on the stage uh, running um, this election process. 
And this process takes place within members of parliaments um, within parliament itself and they will vote all the way down to the final two candidates and then once we have the final two candidates the votes are then open up for the rest of the party now every single member of the party will have one vote uh, and they will vote for the final uh, one of the final two candidates they all have a single vote and that is equal in weight we have a one member one vote system within the conservative party uh, leadership process and it is quite clear that looking at this process if you want to assess this process if you want to look at and analyze some of the uh, implications of this process um, a heavy emphasis is obviously placed on the power of members of parliament because they have a vote on everybody up to the last two candidates so they can whittle down the mps can whittle down quite significantly um the people who are running for the leadership process all the way down to the final two candidates and it is therefore often the case that leadership elections within the conservative party at least at the beginning are votes on the popularity of candidates among mps so you'll see that members of parliament um, who are running for uh, the appointment of the uh, who are running for leadership will um, often spend a lot of time um, getting the votes from members of parliament to keep in the race all the way to the final two uh, outcomes. The final thing I want to talk about is the creation of official policy. Now, this is a very simple process. Um, effectively, it can be described as it being done in a top-down manner. Okay, Unlike the Labour Party, where we have the uh, Labour conventions and stuff that vote on um, what should be in a manifesto, uh, for the most part within the Conservative Party, uh, the leaders of the party have effectively 100% control over what will constitute official party policy. Delegates at the party conference do not have a say or a vote in what may or may not be classed as policy. 